The Battle of Stalingrad has lasted 53 days. By the city on the Volga River, 240,000 German soldiers are caught in a trap. Their powers are exhausted and rescue is a vain hope. On the 8th of January, 1943, the Red Army offers the Germans the opportunity to make an honorable surrender. But Hitler forbids them to negotiate and the Russian offer is rejected. The way I saw it, it was just like a doctor coming to see a patient on his deathbed and then going off without giving the sick man the slightest hope. In a nutshell, leaving him to face death. That's what it seemed like to me. Two days later, the 6th Army is expecting the final stroke. On the 10th, we were in trouble from what I observed through my field glasses. A report of that infantry was advancing, hundreds and thousands of them, and tanks. I couldn't count them, there were at least 50, maybe even more. And my battery commander said, hey, 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 didn't you count them? Seven Soviet armies close in on the Stalingrad pocket, and 200,000 men overrun the German positions. The exhausted men can no longer fight back effectively. The Russian armor broke through. I don't know how it happened in detail, but they literally overran our position. Then turned and came back again to crush the soldiers in the trenches. The tanks kept coming at us. We couldn't run very fast in the snow, so they simply ran over the ones who were there, who couldn't get away. There were soldiers lying there. One of them had lost his legs and was crying, Shoot me! Go on, shoot me, shoot me! And all we could do was to stand there, not moving, and just look at him. You couldn't take your own kit along with you, not if you were helping a wounded man to get away. It was simply not possible to carry both, so you had to leave your stuff behind. The Red Army comes rolling in from the west, over the icy steppes. Thousands flee to the riverbank and the ruins of the fallen city. The Germans call their diminishing ground the Kessel, the cauldron. What we have been through in the last few days is indescribable. There is still worse to come, misery, defeat, and death. The families of the majority who die here are never sent an exact notification. So if you never receive notification, then you should assume that I have either been wounded, taken prisoner, or died of hunger and cold. This is something of a farewell note. I don't know how many more days we can hold out. In a bid to bring the horror to an end, an officer will be flown to Germany. The man chosen is the highly decorated Captain Winrich Beer. And he told me, Beer, we've decided to send you back to Hitler. We must do something to make him see what's going on here. And that will give us some room to negotiate. Paulus was raising the subject of a surrender, a capitulation, on the grounds that, as he said, it no longer made any sense to keep men there, starving and freezing in the cold. Beer's mission is the last desperate approach to the high command in an attempt to save lives. On the 14th of January, the officer arrives at the Fuhrer's headquarters, the Wolf's Lair. He knows that Hitler will not be easily won over. 
Und dann ging die Tür auf und dann kam Then also the door Herr Hitler opened rein und ging Herr Hitler entered and came up to me saying, Heil, Herr Hauptmann. Und ich stand zur Attention und replied, Heil, mein Führer. Dann sagte er, kommen Sie mit. Dann sagte er, kommen Sie mit. Wir gingen durch eine Tür in diesen berühmten Lagerraum. Und ich habe meinen Mut gepflückt und sagte, mein Führer, ich habe meinen Führer gepflückt. I have orders from my commanding general to give you a report and to make a request of you. And now, may I carry out my orders? Keitel was present, and I saw him nod. So then Hitler said, yes. And I must admit that he let me talk for the next three hours. He didn't interrupt or hinder me while I was giving my report or during the discussion. But the decision has been made long before. Stalingrad must be held, no matter what the cost, for the sake of prestige and because it's named after Hitler's enemy, Stalin. And that's why the pitiless tyrant will sacrifice a multitude. Of course, I was angry. I was absolutely furious. Anyway, you could clearly see what people were saying, that Hitler had completely lost contact with reality. Hitler condemns his soldiers to neglect, suffering and hunger. 50 grams of bread, that's the daily ration. The temperature drops to minus 50 degrees Celsius. The cold is their greatest adversary. It claims more victims than enemy action. We had nothing out there on the battlefield, cowering in our foxholes. It was all over, wasn't it? And it was awful, and we couldn't even light a fire at night in case we were spotted. And the everlasting cold was terribly depressing. Thank God. At the time, I had decent winter clothing. Otherwise, I would have frozen to death on the first night. A rat can dig in. An animal burrows into the earth for shelter. But men cannot do that. There's nothing more to say, apart from the fact that misery and weakness have combined to break us. The lice still find something to eat on men whose ribs are showing. Oh, if only our suffering would come to an end. Many soldiers can no longer take the stress. Men started going crazy. They would scream, hit themselves, or even foam at the mouth. Some of them would fall on the snow during attacks and do other strange things. In that place, madness could overcome you in the blink of an eye. To be wounded is to suffer the most gruesome fate of all. In the cellars of the city lie 40,000 injured men. They receive no care at all. And in the cellars, the cellars are full of wounded men, severely wounded, feverish, dying. It stank like the plague in there. The odor was so clinging. It was, how shall I put it? It was like a charnel house where the bodies were still alive. There was a field surgical hospital set up in this factory building, which is where I witnessed the suffering. You can't describe it in detail. If you were to tell anything of what you had seen, but I don't like to do that, because it would be too upsetting. In a tiny back room in the cellars lay cavalry captain St. Paul. Shrapnel had destroyed his cranium and the throbbing brain was exposed. Both his thighs were broken and he was in a highly agitated state. 
shouting orders which disturbed the other 300 patients. They were more or less calmly waiting for their lives to end. Not one of the 300 had the slightest prospect of staying alive. It's not only the Germans who are suffering. This January, in the ruins of the city, there are still thousands of civilians in a daily battle for survival. So long as it wasn't too cold outside, the Russian women and the German troops would go out and cut meat off the dead horses. When the horses were all eaten, they moved on to eating dogs and cats after that. When there was nothing left to eat, then, please excuse me, they would cut slices off the buttocks of frozen corpses. Cannibalism is common at Stalingrad. The Russians and the Germans are guilty of it, without exception. The Soviet prisoners in the Kessel also eat human flesh. There was a camp where several thousand wounded, starving Russian prisoners were held. They either went mad or took to eating human flesh. The Germans couldn't look after the prisoners at all, for they were at death's door themselves. For the German troops, the airfields at Pitomnik and Gumrak offer the last hope. On the 23rd of January, planes come in one by one to evacuate the wounded. There were wounded men in great suffering on either side of the runway. There was a fellow with a Christ-like face. He was older than me and seemed nice. He told me, come on, I'll put my right arm around your shoulder. As he was holding me like that, I saw that he was badly wounded with a hole in his right lower chest. He had a woolen sock shoved in it. You can't imagine what it was like, for the sock kept falling out. And he would take it, this bloody lump, and push it back in. At last, we came to a field dressing station, and he collapsed. Alongside the wounded are specialists who are also waiting to be evacuated. These specialized military staff are destined to escape. The commanding general of my Panzer Corps was ordered out of the Kessel by the Führer on the 18th of January. On the 19th of January, I had to drive him in a half-track to the Gumrock airstrip where he took his leave of us. I can remember it to this day. He never said a word. It was weird. It was traumatic, and I must say that I still cannot understand myself even now. I couldn't summon up the courage to say to the general, can't you take me with you? 